so thank you again very, very much. And um, uh, yes, indeed, I will address uh, an issue which is uh, very demanding, obviously. I don't know whether the students will have the same opinion as I have. <laughs> uh, that we will see. But I'm not definitive on the, the future. And uh, I uh, uh, think that the most important thing is to be humble uh, in front of the facts and uh, not think that uh, we uh, are uh, with a, a science which is, uh, I would say, solving all problems. And uh, the recent period, the last 20 years, we are particularly uh, uh, impressive in this respect uh, with uh, a lot of unexpected events that had to, that went very much against some kind of a common belief uh, of uh, major, uh, the mainstream, say, of economists. So all that being said, I would like uh, to um, speak on inflation. I was given extremely generously something like three quarters of an hour up to possibly one hour. We, I will see. I, I will manage to terminate in time. And uh, I would, um, I would uh, say that, uh, of course, uh, don't be surprised if I uh, mention a lot of multi-layered phenomenon. Uh, I don't trust for one second those who are telling us, you uh, inflation is very low, will remain eternally very low. It's very simple. There are one reason for that. Huh? Or inflation is back and inflation will be back uh, with a vengeance for a very long period of time. And there is a major reason. I don't trust that at all. I think we are in a very complex world, a very complex multi-layered situation, both, I would say, when we are combating deflation uh, with great uh, determination and when we are combating inflation with, I hope, the same determination. So only for us to uh, have a view of what has happened in uh, the recent period of time, I was mentioning periods where we had some kind of overall I would say consensus amongst the economists. One of this period of a very high level of consensus was the period of the great moderation that you, you write in the books, of course, uh, where we, we had uh, a period where a lot of economists thought that uh, with appropriate handling of the situation, we could be for a very long period of time in a period where we would have uh, the uh, low level of inflation, a uh, reasonable level of, uh, of uh, growth, and a uh, reasonably low level of um, uh, unemployment, namely a period, a Goldilocks period, if I may I say the Anglo-Saxon uh, period, which was fantastic. And a lot of economists, as I said, but also political men and women, mentioned that as if really we were in such a situation. I've known that situation myself. I was appointed uh, president of the ECB at a moment where this was more, more or less the mainstream uh, diagnosis, the mainstream assessment of the situation, until we had Lehman Brothers. And Lehman Brothers was really something which was totally unexpected. The worst crisis since World War II in the financial and economic sphere <coughs> was something which was totally unexpected and uh, again uh, made uh, a, a, a big laugh of the sentiment that we had solved all problems. So uh, then uh, this uh, crisis I mentioned, the 08, 07, 08 crisis, for me it is very much 07, 08 because the subprime crisis erupted before the Lehman Brothers crisis and uh, I had to combat myself uh, at the helm of the ECB, the subprime, uh, in a very, very uh, imaginative way at the time. Uh, we uh, decided to give liquidity without any limit in the euro area. We were asked 95 billion euros. I was not expecting it at all that uh, in August 2007 we could be asked by the banks uh, so, such an amount, an extraordinary amount of, uh, of liquidity. We gave the liquidity and uh, we maintained some kind of order 
on our money market problems. But this was in August 2007, long before the crisis of Lehman Brothers, which happened uh, in September 2008. So that being said, uh, the uh, post, I would say, Lehman Brothers phenomenon was very, very uh, surprising, both in the eyes of those who thought that uh, we would uh, we would have uh, we would be back, I would say, to to some kind of normal with some inflationary pressure after this uh, crisis, and uh, those who uh, thought that uh, we would be uh, more or less in a situation of stable economies in the advanced economies. Uh, so I would like to structure my uh, speech in four parts, four chapters, responding to four questions. The first question would be, how can we explain that between the global financial crisis and the COVID crisis, a period of around 10 years, uh, we had a very low inflation, an inflation which was so, so extraordinarily low and pushed down extraordinarily uh, violently that the uh, central banks, uh, both in Europe, in Japan, in the US, uh, were uh, trying or considering their first task to combat the materialization of the deflationary risk. So, First question, why the hell were we in a situation in the advanced economy, but also by way of consequence in many parts of the world, in a situation where, again, the main danger was not inflation, the main danger was not, the main, I would say, responsibility was not to handle with great subtlety the uh, management of the situation, including by the monetary policy of central banks, but uh, the main problem was to try to avoid the materialization of this very dangerous, of course, deflationary risk. First question. Second question, uh, what happened around the middle of 2021, so very recently, in the advanced economy, you will not be surprised that I very much concentrate on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, because the, these are, I would say, big economies, uh, the biggest uh, together with China of the world, uh, with uh, uh, a lot of interaction between them, and of course a lot of influence, unfortunately, because I would expect uh, that this influence would pro progressively diminish, but some kind of uh, big influence on the rest of the world. So. Second question, what happened in the middle of 21, which could explain the reappearance of inflation, a, re, a very strong new inflation, so, I would say surging at a time where the mainstream, again, was not no more the mainstream uh, of, uh, I would say, uh, great moderation. The mainstream was inflation is very low eternally. And it, it's at this very moment where inflation was supposed to be very low eternally with, uh, of course, a lot of uh, appropriate uh, uh, countering by the central banks and by the other, uh, I would say, respective authorities. Mm. How the hell could it be that uh, we had to cope with inflation? You will see in my speech that uh, it was not easy to recognize that this was really indeed uh, a new I would say surge of inflation, that it was not transitory, it was uh, lasting, and it had to be combat as uh, the new main, I would say, responsibility of um, uh, this particular uh, constituency of authorities, which were the central banks. A third question, which I will try to explain or respond to, why was it so difficult for governments, for the economists, for market operators and for central banks to understand fully that indeed there was a re re resurgence of inflation. What were the phenomena that were playing against such a recognition, such a, 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 an assessment that we were in a new situation? And it's very important. One of my main uh, 
I would say, uh, message is certainly don't trust necessarily mainstream analysis. Very often they're wrong. And uh, so be prepared for the unexpected. And that's very, very important because, because uh, it's uh, not only, I would say, authorities have a tendency when they are really reasonably satisfied with the situation to prolong, uh, to extrapole, extrapolate their, uh, their sentiment. But, uh, but uh, everybody has that sentiment, including economists. And uh, when I'm, I was speaking of mainstream economists, mainstream economists uh, are now, <laughs> and this is perhaps the point where I might have a difference of view <laughs> with some of you, um, the mainstream economists are now saying, after having said inflation is definitively very low forever, and don't care for inflation, and interest rates are very, very low forever, so borrow, 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 and so forth. Now you have a new emerging mainstream saying, well, there are many reasons, and I share the view, for uh, the inflationary pressure to be back, and therefore we will have inflation in the future, and we don't trust that we could go back to price stability. I don't suggest that this is the new mainstream, because I see particularly as regards uh, inflation expectations, that uh, uh, the uh, inflation seems to be, at least in the eyes of many uh, economists, market participants, investors and savers, more or less, uh, it, it seems uh, to them that uh, we are more or less credible with the central banks, more or less credible when we say we will be back to price stability at a certain level, and I will go back to that certain level because I, I take it that it is extremely important uh, for a, a, a long period of time, but it will call, of course, for uh, a, a great determination from the central banks, a great capacity to take appropriate decisions, even if they are very different from what we had to do in the past, including tougher than what we did before Lehman Brothers crisis. So, I will express in my conclusion some kind of confidence in the capacity of the central banks and of, I would say, all our uh, system, very complex system, so not only the central banks but also governments, authorities in general, and of course the private sector to, uh, I would say, take the appropriate decisions, but of course with a major influence of central banks, uh, for uh, price stability to be back. Now, uh, I mentioned four questions. Let me turn to the response to the four questions. So, first question, why had inflation disappeared? Or why inflation looked like uh, it had disappeared? I, ha I see five reasons. I m mentioned already the fact that you will have always uh, a number of causes, a number of reasons, a number of elements. I mentioned the multi-layered analysis that I will propose. So, out of the, first, uh, the five reasons. First, uh, I would say that uh, we had the mechanistic consequence of the Lehman Brothers crisis. Lehman Brothers crisis, I already mentioned that, was the worst economic and financial crisis we had since World War II. So it had a lot of scars on the global, on, on the global economy, on the national economies. It lowered economic growth considerably in the advanced economy in comparison with their previous uh, potential growth. Output gaps were very negative. It is a phenomenon that we uh, are observing any time we have a, a major crisis. Output gaps were negative, which of course uh, uh, pushing down inflation. Then we pro progressively reviewed the potential growth and the potential growth was uh, reviewed down still in my own analysis. And I think it is largely shared the uh, I would say overall uh, uh, negative output gaps remained uh, not exactly at the same dramatic level as immediately after Lehman Brothers, but at, at a very uh, low level. So that's a, 
of course, a first reason, which is a textbook reason. A second reason uh, was the formidable acceleration of globalization, which marked, I would say, particularly, probably, this period of 10 years, I am analysis, between Lehman Brothers and the COVID crisis. So, uh, the idea that, um, I would say, uh, uh, every, I would say, participants in the uh, global markets had to uh, try to find out the best compromise in uh, optimizing the uh, various components of any product or any service they would uh, render. And uh, that was called as something which was absolutely normal. We were not hampered by other considerations at the time. And so globalization, as um, is usually say, which means, of course, uh, very long, uh, I would say, global uh, value, uh, value chains uh, with uh, uh, absence uh, of a preoccupation of the possible risks which are associated with a very long global value chain, all uh, this period was again a period of acceleration of globalization. It was, a, of course, a major cause for uh, low prices, overall prices, and for uh, cause of inflation going down, uh, lower, I would say, than what would have happened if we did not have to uh, cope with, uh, observe this phenomenon of globalization. A third reason was, is very, very important also in my analysis, was the uh, weakening of the bargaining power of trade unions, organized labor, and of workers and employees over a long period of time in the United States and in many advanced economies. I would not uh, suggest that it was the case in all economies concerned, uh, not necessarily in all advanced economies. Uh, for instance, for the French citizens here, I would say I, I don't share the view that uh, we had a formidable weakening of the bargaining power of labor in this country in particular. But all taken into account, it's clear that in many advanced economies, and certainly in the US, we had this phenomenon. Uh, abnormally low growth in nominal and real wages in a number of economies and to the extent of course that inflation is closely correlated with changes in unit uh, production cost the uh, result uh, by uh, combining, uh, combining productivity gains and nominal wage increases was low prices low inflation it's not the sole phenomenon it's one out of five but clearly we had a phenomenon which has been, and I will go back to that, recognized as a major factor of the inequalities, which is, as you know, of course, one of the major uh, factors analyzed now, not only at the level of the advanced economy, also at the level of the emerging economies, including China. A fourth factor, which uh, was also important in my view, was what we could document, uh, and I think that it, it was clearly one of this uh, economist consensus that I don't criticize, the savings glut. At a global level, it was documented that we, are, we had more savings than investment. More savings than investment, meaning at a global level, I'm not speaking of the US particularly because it's exactly the reverse in the US. There is no excess of saving, as you know, there is a terrible lack of savings in the US, but, or in France, by the way. But uh, all taken into account at a global level, this has been, in my uh, opinion, very well documented. And of course, it has two consequences. One is that it exerts some kind of pressure on prices at a global level, and it also exerts a pressure on real interest rates at a global level, pushing down the real interest rates because you have an excess of capital and uh, not much, uh, I would say, demand for investment uh, at a global level. So that, that is something which is important. And all what I say, by the way, is very important, in particular because I will have to explain why there has been a dramatic change of this uh, situation after, I would say, uh, to simplify, uh, 
mid-2021. I mentioned five reasons. I could mention, of course, uh, the uh, fifth reason, which uh, is the COVID itself, which uh, augmented even more dramatically the uh, phenomenon of very low inflation uh, because we had the synchronized threat of implosion of uh, various, uh, all the economies of the world, to be frank, uh, uh, even if some were imploding much more than others because they perhaps had the capacity to block their economy when others had not that capacity. I'm speaking particularly of the developing world and the emerging world. But in the advanced economy, it was absolutely clear that uh, we, you had both to cope with uh, an implosion of demand and an implosion of supply. And that, of course, uh, created an additional uh, element of potential deflation, which explains that uh, there was, even during the first phase of the COVID, as long as the COVID itself was adding to this uh, dramatic threat of deflation, the economy, the central banks were the, uh, I would say, guardian uh, against the materialization of the deflation. And uh, not surprisingly, you had at this time a formidable augmentation of accommodation by all central banks. Accommodation had been the mark of the policy, the monetary policy, since uh, Lehman Brothers, but it was even more accentuated, accentuated uh, both, I would say, uh, in, uh, I would say, certainly the US, certainly Europe, and all economies in the world that had the margin of maneuver to do that. So extremely low interest, and uh, also uh, extraordinary uh, I would say, determination to accentuate even more the uh, non-standard measures that had been experienced during the 10 years since Lehman Brothers, but that were also formidably augmented. I'm mentioning, of course, uh, that is called now uh, generally QE. Uh, the European have their own, I would say, uh, I would say bipolar, if I may, way of dealing with that. There is the longer term uh, refinancing operation, the LTRO, targeted refinancing operation, on the one hand, which are very powerful, non-standard measures, uh, at least non-standard seen from the US and the other central banks. And you have uh, also, of course, the massive purchases of negotiable securities, uh, public and private, which uh, had been also formidably accentuated uh, in the advanced economy with the COVID. So we had a combination of extraordinary accommodating policies, both, I would say, traditional and non-traditional. And uh, only to give you one idea of what it represented at a global level, if I take only the four major uh, central banks of the advanced economy that are uh, in the, that issues currencies that are in the basket of the SDR, the special drawing rights. My own computation at the peak of this um, uh, QE or quasi QE operations gave me something like 25 billion US dollar and more if you compute that in euro, uh, accumulated in the balance sheets of the central banks, those four central banks, during all the period which goes from the uh, Lehman Brothers crisis up to the, uh, I would say, peak uh, in the COVID crisis. So you see uh, enormous accommodation, unseen accommodation. I would say it's really a premier at a global level, certainly, as I said, I always have to, to make the difference between those countries that had the possibilities of being that accommodating and those who had not that possibility. And, and that makes a difference. But to take those who had the mean to be as accommodating as possible for themselves and also uh, influencing also the global economy, 25 trillion.
25,000 billion. So uh, that was my uh, very uh, short response to my first question. Now, second question, why did inflation come back? Come back? Why? And um, again, uh, I already said that uh, I would mention a multi-layer explanation, which doesn't mean that I think that inflation is back now forever, as I uh, was uh, clear uh, a moment ago. But we, we have eight main causes, eight. First, the trigger for uh, the uh, inflation going back was the post-COVID recovery. It was a catalyst for inflation because, uh, because as well as all the economies concerned had been placed in a synchronized threat of implosion or a real implosion, frankly speaking, from the demand side and the supply side, we had there an explosion of the demand because all the uh, constraints that were uh, constraining demand were uh, alleviated at that very moment which I can date quite precisely mid-21 uh, and you had uh, still of course the scars of the previous period on the supply. So you had a, I would say textbook situation where demand was immense and supply was not uh, at all I would say at the level of the demand. And there was a hunger to consume on the one hand by, and particularly augmented uh, by not only the forced savings which were made by uh, the various uh, households, for instance, uh, but also by the money which was given by the governments uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and everywhere where again the uh, room for maneuvering existed. And that, of course, triggered something which is absolutely uh, natural, as I say, a textbook consequence which was uh, a push of inflation, on inflation. Uh, there was a slight difference between the US and Europe and I, I could, if you look at it very very closely, you will see that it was more in the first half of 2021 that we had this uh, going back of inflation in the US and uh, more in the second part of 21 that it appeared in Europe. But nevertheless, we had a large deal of synchronization between the uh, two sides of the Atlantic and the advanced economy as a whole. A second reason was uh, there was some delay and I will come back to the delay because it's one of my questions but obviously there was a delay. Governments, executive authorities, central banks uh, waited before taking the necessary decisions. Uh, I would, I would say mention a delay of perhaps six months in between uh, the, the judgment on uh, there is inflation and that inflation is not only totally transitory but maybe uh, sustainable in the medium run and uh, uh, that, that is a, a second important cause. I will go back to the reason why we could observe that but again Take it that it is a second reason, not negligible. A third reason, which uh, of course the fact that uh, we have the integral, if I may, of the extraordinary accommodating uh, monetary policy which had been accumulated since Lehman Brothers in various forms, including in the non-standard form of QE and accumulation of QE and so forth. So you had a level of central bank money, base money, which was extremely high. I don't say that to criticize the past politics, uh, policy. I think that they were uh, appropriate to take into account the deflationary risk, which would have been, if materialized, dramatic for everybody, including the most vulnerable part of our uh, population. Still, of course, it has an influence and it is one of the reasons, not the only one. Some orthodox people are telling uh, it very simple. Inflation comes out of all the QE you have accumulated. And uh, that's si as simple as that. And it is the reason I would not certainly uh, 
echo that, I would only say there is a point there which is part of the, uh, I would say, problem of inflation we have to cope with now. That was for the third reason. Now, a fourth cause is uh, more or less the symmetric of what I just said. You had very accommodating monetary policy during a long period of time. You had very accommodating fiscal policies for a long period of time. And that, that is, I would say, absolutely clear. Again, justified by the fact that maybe we could have had the materialization of deflation and that would have been totally dramatic. So it was normal that uh, there was uh, a particular attention given on fiscal policy. That being said, only for you to remember, because it's very recent, uh, at the very beginning of the new Biden administration in the US, a Democrat, a friend of mine, by the way, Larry Summers, uh, who had been the Secretary of the Treasury of Clinton, so not suspected to be against the new Democrat uh, administration, uh, said, you are too accommodating on the fiscal side at the beginning of the new administration, beware of inflation. And that was quite courageous for him to say that, but he trusted that uh, uh, there was a possibility that piling up of, um, of uh, I would say, expansionary uh, fiscal policies could be dangerous from the standpoint of inflation and from other standpoints. So he said that publicly. Of course, inflation came after he had said that. So he's now uh, considered uh, a genius uh, <laughs> at a global level uh, because it, it, it is not that, I would say, uh, uh, frequent uh, that you can say something will happen. You're doing, you're doing, you're engaging in a, a kind of a policy that uh, is dangerous, and, and you are, I would say, vindicated by what's happening. So, only to say that the fourth reason is not negligible, and you have to uh, keep in mind that the U.S. has been much more accommodating on the fiscal side than the European themselves. Even if the European, as you say, were very keen on saying the Stability and Growth Pact, we don't care anymore, and so forth. But still, the US were even more accommodating. So, the two uh, first causes I have mentioned are, I would say, cyclical in nature. I mentioned phenomenon that uh, happens at a certain moment, uh, but not, uh, are not necessarily sustainable in, in the medium and long run. The uh, two uh, other causes, namely the, the integral, the piling up of accommodating policies, monetary and fiscal, I would say are both <laughs> cyclical and structural. Uh, I cannot say that they are entirely cyclical, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they, they are not, I would say, necessarily, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, and not necessarily a structural, long term, as will be the uh, next three causes. And you will not be surprised that the next three causes are more or less the reverse of what I already said to explain very low inflation. So, globalization as we, uh, I would say, experience it is no more there. No more there in the minds. So nobody now, uh, amongst those who decide uh, how they will manage their, um, I would say, long uh, uh, chains of, uh, of uh, value over the globe, those are now reflecting, and the COVID exert an influence, the geostrategic tensions all over the world exert their influence, the uh, uh, sentiment in practically all economies that you have to be sure that you are not too depending on the outside world and that you are not too uh, possibly blackmailed by those who are supplying uh, various components for your, uh, I would say, equipment or uh, your products, your services. So this has dramatically changed. We, you could see that in all your countries, I think, the 
articles are uh, very much concentrated on uh, at certain moment we are badly lacking uh, uh, vaccines, we are badly lacking medicine, even the, the low key medicine, we are badly lacking uh, uh, of course uh, all, all what is appropriate in terms of, uh, of uh, food, of uh, bref. I would say global trade is put into question, but more, much more important, global long value chains are in question. Uh, I will mention, of course, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, voted in the US in 2022 as a very important materialization of this idea because it includes a raft of in incentives to locate key production facilities in the US. And we see that ourselves in Europe because a lot of companies are investing now in the US and not in Europe because they are given a lot of subsidies that do not exist normal normally and did not exist before. So I, I, I don't think that I have to expand more on this reversal of the very highly positive views on globalization we had before, most importantly because it permits our population to have lower prices, which is after all a good of course uh, for, for the population. But now we are looking at it in a different fashion and um, that is of course something which uh, permits me to think that uh, it is from a secular structural standpoint that now we have to accept that there uh, are new pushes for inflation in the future than they were in the past. Uh, six uh, uh, causes, uh, which is also structural. The, I will not expand too much on that. I already mentioned as a cause for low inflation, the very low level of real and nominal augmentation of wages for uh, the, medium, the medium class population, the blue colors in particular, the lower middle class population, those who are not educated, uh, highly educated. Uh, now, it was an economic problem. It was documented economically and certainly uh, in Europe, uh, more than in the US at the time. Now it emerges at the political level. You can reinterpret what happened in the US with the election of Donald Trump in the previous, uh, uh, I would say, uh, sequence of uh, political uh, uh, votation in the US. Uh, very highly paradoxically, a president that was coming from the Republican Party was not representing the big business, at least clearly on the political uh, analysis, but the blue colors. And he was defending the blue colors with great determination, making, of course, a, a terrible wake-up call for the Democrats that realized that they were losing a large part of the traditional uh, electorate to the benefit of the Republican. So I, I date from the election of Trump as I said, the emergence at a political level of a problem which was before an economic problem, but not yet in our democracies, a highly acute political problem. So, of course, this changes drastically the situation. We will see what happens. My own analysis is that it would not be thinkable because of the change of perception, both in the Republican Party and in the Democrat Party in the US, it is not thinkable that they will neglect the remuneration, nominal and real, of the lower middle class as they did in the past. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, there will not, uh, we will not have dramatic consequences of uh, what uh, has happened in the period of, uh, say, eight years, which goes with, uh, from, from uh, election of Trump up to the new elections, but it is my um, very strong sentiment. Should not surprise anybody in Europe because, again, we, we have the sentiment that uh, this is a real issue. It has to be coped with. Uh, 
and again, uh, I, I don't want to mention any particular country, but, uh, but uh, the mines in Europe are much closer to before what I document as the dramatic change of attitude of the political sphere in the US. It was already the case potentially in Europe. Now, I will not dare embark on what is the, I would say, reflection of what I just said in the uh, emerging world or in the uh, developing world. If I take China, which after all is the most important uh, uh, GDP of the world in terms of uh, purchasing power uh, standard, uh, clearly this theme of inequalities uh, is in the mind and in the rhetoric of the leadership. So uh, there is not, from that standpoint, much difference between what I document as something which is generalized now in the advanced economy and what is emerging also in a large part of the world. Um, that was for the sixth reason. Seven reason, the green transition. So I will go very fast because I could spend a lot of time on the green transition. But clearly, as regards the green transition, uh, we, we, have, we have to be aware of a tendency of, uh, I would say, governments or responsible entities to say it's a win-win game. We will both, I would say, save the planet on the one hand and create a lot of new jobs and new products and so forth and so forth, and there is no cost associated with that. We know that there are costs associated with the green transition. It's obvious when you reflect on the fact that the idea is to change all the productive system at a global level, to, uh, I would say, embark largely in new investment, and also to replace the stock of old investment because it becomes obsolete. Uh, all this, of course, has a cost. And that, that is the reason why I take it that uh, what I said on the uh, positive effect, if I may, of the um, uh, so-called, uh, uh, I would say, uh, savings glut on low inflation and so forth, will be, in my opinion, reversed. I don't suggest that it's already reversed. We will see there are a lot of resistance to embark on what all what is necessary. and. It is necessary for the planet. We have only one single spaceship, so we are absolutely right to say that we have to save our spaceship. But it will have a cost, and that cost will be also paid in potentially higher inflation pressure, in my opinion, and also in higher real interest rates at a global level. Exactly the reverse of what I call as the consequences of the savings glut. So, again, seven uh, causes, the three last ones being structural. And, of course, one possible, uh, I would say, uh, comment would be, but now we are in a totally different world. We will have inflation in the future, and inflation will get up in the future. And you say yourself <laughs> that uh, as a central bank, or former central bank, you say yourself that this is a different world. It's not the same world as before. Uh, now let me say a word on the eight causes, because I said that uh, we had eight reasons why we uh, had this uh, surge of inflation. Uh, I don't want to minimize at all war in Ukraine and war everywhere in the world, real or potential. Uh, but particularly the war in Ukraine, which for the European is a war in Europe, is a war in Europe with a lot of consequences in terms of price of oil, price of gas, uh, dramatic change in the, uh, I would say, overall access by the European to oil and gas, and also price of food, price of uh, cereals, and so forth. So we, we are in Europe particularly touched by this um, phenomenon, and I take it that it is absolutely legitimate to mention uh, this uh, uh, war as one of the causes of inflation. 
hitting the European much more than the new hemisphere in general or the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, but uh, again, uh, ha has to be considered as one of the issues we have to cope with. Of course, I hope that it will not be eternal. Uh, we will see. Uh, my, my sentiment is that uh, uh, after a first bump of inflation in Europe, to the extent that we measure inflation on a 12-month basis, uh, we have uh, uh, now more or less, uh, if I look at the core inflation and headline inflation on both sides of the Atlantic, we are not that different now. We had a big, big difference at a certain moment, clearly. Headline was uh, higher in Europe than in the US because of food, because of energy. Uh, at the moment I'm speaking, I would say that the last figure I have, our December figure, figure, we will have to update that very soon. But we had in the US uh, headline inflation of around 3.4%. Uh, when uh, in the U in Europe we are at 2.9 in December, so 0.5 percent of difference, and the Europeans are lower in headline now than the, in the U.S. Again, it does not capture the fact that we were hit much more than the U.S. before. And as regards core inflation, or say uh, the the inflation which is computed without taking into account energy and without taking into account uh, food, uh, we arrive at 3.4 in Europe and 3.9 in the US. Again, 0.5% difference. As you see, these are not big difference, <coughs> meaning that uh, if I uh, had looked at core since the peak of the core, you see very clearly that there is a diminishing of core inflation very fortunately, I have to say, on both sides of the Atlantic, which of course gives me, and you will see my, my sentiment uh, at the end, uh, gives me some, uh, I would say, credibility when I would, uh, I would say, I, I trust that we, we will re-establish some kind of uh, price stability. So, uh, <coughs> I will now go back to uh, the uh, why it's my third question, if I'm not misled. Why such a difficult assessment? And now I see time elapsing, I will go extremely rapidly. Three reasons. Three reasons for the difficult assessment. Because, as I said, we had an hesitation of public authorities, economists, markets, mid-21, both in the US and in Europe. Uh, and I can document that very, very clearly. Even in October 21, Jay Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, was still saying in October 21, inflation is transitory. And um, uh, we will get back to price stability around 2%, he said, in the course of 2022. Uh, of course, uh, he was saying that on the basis of the analysis which were uh, produced by his own staff. So economists themselves were convinced that we could reasonably expect going back to price stability very quickly. And uh, my explanation is of course uh, that uh, it, they were extrapolating what we had observed during 10 years before. But I'll, I will give you <laughs> again, you will forgive me, I'm systematic, the five reasons why to me, we can explain the difficulty, the long period of time uh, between the moment we had to cope with inflation and the moment we recognized that it was for real and that inflation was not fully transitory. So the first reason is perfectly ex explainable. Uh, you had a lot of economists, and that is right, which were considering that they had to cope only with a supply shock when you had to, to cope only with a supply shock, then you normally consider that it is not necessarily the case for having a very important change 
in your monetary policy, you would ride out the temporary shocks without taking substantial action. Uh, that, that is uh, something which has been said very clearly, particularly in Europe, I have to say. We have, a, a, I would say, a lot of uh, supply shock in Europe because of the war in Ukraine in particular, and that, that calls for uh, not uh, reacting immediately violently. The US have a big demand shock, in particular because they had an immense accommodating supply, uh, uh, fiscal policy, and for other reasons, and therefore they uh, were more, I would say, uh, 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 obliged to react uh, violently. So I mentioned that this is perfectly legitimate. When you are in favor of a surge of inflation of that kind, you are legitimate in trying to understand exactly where does it come from and what, is the comp what are the components of supply and demand shocks that are inbuilt in the phenomenon you are observing. A second reason was, I already mentioned that, common belief between economists that after all we had explanation to explain convincingly very low inflation and threat of deflation. Why the hell would uh, that uh, change dramatically uh, overnight? Uh, no, it will continue to be there and the deflationary pressure or the low inflationary pressure will continue. So many eminent economists, many very eminent economists, and that's one of the reasons why we have to reflect by ourselves and not necessarily trust uh, any kind of mainstream or uh, leading, uh, ma leading minds, uh, were thinking that and, and were elo very eloquent on that. A third point is that uh, forward guidance play a role. Yeah, I don't know, I, I could not elaborate on forward guidance, had no time, but Amongst the non, I would say, standard measures that were taken in monetary policy, you had not only this uh, targeted long-term refinancing operations in Europe, I mentioned, or the QE, or the various kind of QE uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and everywhere in the world. You had also the forward guidance. Forward guidance meaning, I say in advance that whatever happens, I will continue to be as accommodating as possible. That, that's the essence of the forward guidance. And when you are risking the materialization of deflation permanently, one can understand why it appears uh, something which is uh, natural after all. Huh? Uh, the main danger being deflation, you can say uh, and reassure the markets, uh, you can be sure that we will continue to be accommodating for a long period of time. That is the forward guidance. So, of course, when you have said all the markets and, and your own people, we will continue to be accommodating for a very long period of time, it's a little bit difficult to say, huh, inflation is there. We said that, but we were wrong, and now we embark on the appropriate monetary policy. So I think that um, from that standpoint, it is something which is also quite important. We have to perhaps beware of forward guidance. Now, uh, <coughs> There was a technical issue which I draw your attention to, don't elaborate on that. Unfortunately, in my opinion, on both sides of the Atlantic, the idea had been that we would uh, correlate the uh, interest rates policy on the interest rates policy on the one hand and the QE on the other hand. And the idea that we could augment interest rate or change the policy on the interest rate side only after having stopped the QE, the active QE, was something which was, again, like forward guidance, explainable when your principal danger is materialization of deflationary risk, but which appears to be a, a little bit, uh, uh, I would say, clumsy when you have to change policy, and of course changing policy would perhaps mean accelerating everything, including the interest rates uh, increase. So I take it that the two major central banks, the Fed and the European Central Bank, had to wait for augmenting their rates from minus 0.5% in Europe, from zero in the US, after having terminated, stopped their net purchases on the market. Uh, 
and that I would say explains a number of months uh, in my opinion uh, it was not necessarily very appropriate to link the two and to correlate the two and there is a last point which uh, will p perhaps is the most uh, be, be the most interesting for your uh, economist brain uh, in this uh, room because it's it's really something where we have to work a lot and understand much better what is happening in in the in our economies the uh, neo keynesian dynamic stochastic general equilibrium that are utilized by every uh, economist in the world those models are dominating in the ecb in the us and uh, in the private sector as well are not very good to i would say uh, document and certainly not to anticipate the abrupt transition abrupt transition lehman brother abrupt transition where do we go after lehman brother and i could experience myself all my models i was in the ecb at the time were not at all explaining that the european economy were, was falling like a stone uh, we were permanently late in our own uh, modeling on what was really happening to the extent that i was obliged to go to the private sector directly and uh, ask them uh, what they were observing because uh, again uh, when we were looking after uh, quarter after after quarter at what had happened in comparison with what we had anticipated uh, the difference was absolutely gigantic the, the real uh, i would say economy was uh, two standard deviation out of what uh, had been foreseen in the uh, general equilibrium uh, model. Uh, so when the president of the Central Bank of the US, Jay Powell, says, I think it is transitory, he more or less says what the uh, standard model are uh, giving him. And uh, he cannot necessarily make a dramatic criticism of what is produced by the staff. Uh, so I don't want to elaborate more on that. I think that this is a very, very important point. We, we have to concentrate on modeling those, I would say, abrupt changes that happen from time to time. And in this very short uh, speech, I have mentioned uh, a number of such abrupt changes that we are not anticipated at all and are, I would say, inside the uh, sphere of uh, economy, finance and, uh, and uh, monetary policy. Of course, COVID was out of this uh, element. Uh, it's something which was totally uh, uh, abruptly coming in that sphere. But the uh, transition from, I would say, the, I would say, uh, the first period of uh, nice general equilibrium, great moderation, to a dramatic change of the, the march of our economy. And uh, the dramatic change from very low inflation to inflationary pressures that are quite big, all this calls for a new, I would say, understanding of the appropriate modeling. So, now, uh, I think that uh, David will tell me that I'm very close to the limit of my speech. No? You, you, you can say that. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> so, will we return to price stability? The, say that it is my conclusion. Uh, I trust that uh, we have a number of reasons, again, <laughs> to think that you will observe with me that in year 2025, in a number of uh, advanced economies and by way of consequence in a number of other economies in the world we will be back to something which would be quite reasonable with a core inflation around two percent in 25. why am i so confident that we are likely to observe that and i take a risk because uh, 
there, of course, you will check whether what I say is reasonable or not. Uh, again, I think that the reasons are the following. I see three main reasons. One is that the central banks have not speaking uh, for, uh, I would say, pleasing anybody in the recent period of time. We had, since it was said, it is not, I would say, uh, transitory. It is sustainable. It is sticky. And we have to take the appropriate decisions. Now, you will tell me, I always say that they were a little late in taking the first decision. But since the first decision, we had 11 increase of interest rates in the US. If I'm not misled, successive increase of interest rates, which uh, never happened uh, in the history of the Fed. And uh, we had also four consecutive hikes of 0.75%, which means something and again is uh, unobserved in the past. Uh, the European have increased their own rates by 10 times. And uh, both had stopped, as you know, uh, uh, it was uh, done, it was stopped in the US since uh, July 23. And the interest rates are at that level uh, since July 23 in the US and in Europe. It stopped in September 23 with a total increase in the US of 5.25% in Europe of 4.40%, meaning that now we have the lowest rate, the lowest useful rate at the level of 4% in Europe because we started from the uh, interest of deposit at the level of minus 0.5 and now we are at 4. And in the US they were at 0, they are at 5.25. So, first reason, clearly the central banks have shown great determination. Second reason, and this is the most important reason I can give you, and it would be my conclusion, because after all I have to conclude uh, on something which is perhaps interesting for you, and is not, and you probably did not read. Uh, in any articles what I will tell you. So uh, I, I dare say that this is something which is not very well uh, communicated and understood now. The four central banks I have mentioned, namely the US Fed, the ECB, Bank of Japan, Bank of England, that are the four central banks that are issuing the currency that are in the basket of the SDR, Special Drawing Rights together with the renminbi of China. So these four central banks have the same definition of price stability since, say, the Lehman Brothers crisis. The US joined the ECB and the UK central bank in 2012 to say, OK, for us, price stability is around 2% in the medium run. And Japan said in 13, for us, price stability is around 2% in the medium run. So you see, for the first time ever, and certainly for the first time since the Bretton Woods system exploded, we have major central banks in the world, considered by the IMF, as having more, being more or less the guardians of the international monetary system, together with the IMF, uh, are, are, have now the same definition of price stability. I, I'm very proud of that because, by the way, the European were the first, but it was considered appropriate by all other central banks to join. And that, of course, creates something which uh, did not happen when we had the first and the second oil shock, you remember, we had the inflation galloping, uh, we had in the Fed uh, the absolute necessity to regain control. Paul Volcker augmented short-term interest rate up to 20%, uh, not, not 5 or, or 4, 20% in order to regain control. We had an abominable crisis in Latin America coming out of the explosion of inflation and therefore of the explosion of interest rates and and and. Uh, 
So we are now in a different universe. We are now in a universe where even at a moment after mid-21, where it could have been possible for the US Fed to say, well, in the past, uh, it was in the time of Ben Bernanke, we had decided to consider 2% as the right and appropriate definition of price stability, but um, now we see things are different. Uh, when uh, things change, you change yourself, your policy, and so forth. No, they said we stick to what we had said with the view that anchoring expectations was absolutely fundamental in a period where precisely for structural reasons inflation was particularly dangerous. And all central banks said that. Of course, I was expecting that from the European Central Bank. But again, the fact that the US, UK and Japan, Japan is a little bit in a, another, another mode, but Japan also could be in that, uh, in that situation uh, is very, very important. And I take it that it is probably the main reasons which pushed me in the direction of, I would say, optimism in terms of going back to price stability. Now, I had a very vibrant conclusion, but those who read the paper know on the fact that uh, low inflation, price stability was absolutely essential not only for the economy to function correctly, and I don't trust those who say we were, if we were at three or four, that would be much better. And certainly for the most, I would say, vulnerable segment of all our populations. Because the richer you are, or the wealthiest you are, the most easily you can protect yourself against inflation. The less, the most vulnerable you are, the less wealthy and so forth, the least wealthy, then you are touched by inflation, which is uh, uh, very, very asymmetric in its impact. So I hope that I convince you and that we have no disagreement at all on what will happen. <laughs>